always like to enter with a dramatic music. It uh, makes things better. I was asked to speak about pricing a product and I actually decided not to because I want to talk about T-shirts. So I'm sure quite a lot of you here are uh, owning one or at least you have been able to see one, be it on the internet or in some sort of a shop. If you think about a T-shirt, sometimes the value is quite important. If you're going on a trip somewhere far away and your luggage gets lost, this T-shirt that is on your back becomes your only rescue to be able to stay. On the other hand, you have potentially a lot of T-shirts and you change them according to your mood, color. But how do you price that? What is actually the value of this? So I decided to go on one of my favorite places, the internet, and checked what was the thinking of the internet about the cost of a price for a T-shirt. What I was able to find out is that you have the possibility to buy a T-shirt for $1,250. Clearly there's some gold embedded in it or something special. I decided to also check if there was a possibility to not pay that much. And the outcome was fantastic. $2, I don't even know what I can buy for $2 in Helsinki, but I'm sure that, you know, with a 67% discount, this T-shirt that kicked off at $5.99, you've made a bargain and you're able to go through this airport situation in a successful way, probably in a good kind of manner. Well, the truth is, is this, this T-shirt symbolizes every single product that every single one of you is building here. We have the necessity to use T-shirts, but we also have the necessity to use software. That's why we're building it. That's why investors put money behind us. The problem that we have though now is that we're living in an economic situation where GDP is not growing significantly globally. There's an economically unstable setup, which is allowing for businesses to question the cost expenditure, to question the size of their teams. And Ultimately, the only thing that saves you is the idea that you can put a cost for your price that is able to justify all the efforts that you've put in a reality where maybe it's not particularly allowed to charge a lot because people are not willing to spend a lot. Well, if you start thinking within this context of what is particularly useful to you, like how do I go about on phasing out maybe obesity out of my pricing? How do I actually create value for the businesses that I'm working with or for the consumers that I'm working with? The internet is yet another place that can confuse you significantly because the truth is any startup playbook is actually allowing for us to look at different tactics that are not always maybe the most appropriate for your business. To start off with, we'll talk about the freemium model. This is the idea that someone sends you the link to their app and asks you, please download this. Oh, by the way, probably like in 24 hours, I'm going to charge you something. You've seen some value and then you've gone out, probably because you don't want to pay for it because they didn't convince you that much. There's, of course, the retainer model. Someone tells you, I'm going to come, I'm going to deliver and based on the outcome, I'm actually going to be charging you a percentage. This model is interesting because it has been used across the board. There's a lot of companies that have built up a lot of revenue out of that. But in today's reality, it is probably one that you should remember because most likely the cost is associated also to the value that you're bringing to the clients. We know, of course, in SaaS, like you have also per feature pricing, you're talking about I'm going to add a module to the platform and then you're going to be able to cover even more data points. There you go. But if you want to go into that tangent where you're assessing maybe further your uh, data or you're inviting further clients, then you really are talking about more money that potentially you make and this person will be charged. Why this model is particularly confusing is because before the customers checked and tested this particular feature, they don't really know if you're bringing this value to them, right? They probably only understand the value that you've been able to bring beforehand. 
there's discounts, there's vouchers. If you think about this T-shirt, it was 67% discounted. And it was also one where I don't even want to talk about the environmental footprint associated to it. Sorry, guilty, climate tech founder. And on top of that, like, there's been a set of steps that have been taken one after the other for this business to be maybe successful, marketing and so on. But the ultimate connection that you have to the particular brand is this T-shirt that is of this quality, that is coming at a lower cost, but at the cost of what? Regardless of the model that we're talking about, the pricing setup that you're going to go for, the tactics, the vouchers, the discounts, we're really talking about the destiny of a T-shirt, which is going into three particular tangents. You have sales, after we've gone through the whole production of the T-shirt, transportation, the water consumption, the marketing, you are looking into a reality where maybe the T-shirt gets sold. Yay, we know the margins, it's going to work out. Maybe the T-shirt doesn't get sold, so we come to the end of the season, and there's an outlet or some sort of a setup where someone tells you, Black Friday or whatever it is. Maybe there's a case where the T-shirt doesn't even get sold. And this means that all of the efforts for a business that has taken the steps beforehand, the marketing campaign, the materials, the value that has gone into the creative process of creating this particular product is gone and it's wasted. Because maybe the T-shirt is going to sit on a shelf in the office of the company. Maybe it's going to go on a landfill. Maybe it will be thrown away and kind of not even properly recycled. You might wonder, like, why does this really matter? Why are we talking about T-shirts when it comes to a software, hardware, tech conference? For six years, I've been building Plan A, and what has been particularly interesting is that as much as we might want to be this cool tech startup community that is always with the most innovative ideas, the moment when you're actually starting to scale and you're starting to play the big money game where you are really looking into how do I actually support a corporate how do I actually bring value to my clients? You are looking into the reality check that the tech cool startup game is not anymore allowed because you need to deliver value that is not just for the next quarter, but with the thinking that your company is there to IPO, your company is there to get to a growth level that is allowing for success. And all of a sudden, when you're in an economic situation like the one that we have now, and I'm sure quite a few of you here are looking into fundraising, are looking into getting more clients, clients and investors simultaneously question at this particular point if the value that you're putting out to the world is really making enough of a difference for you to be able to withstand any of the challenges that are coming up for the next economic situation. Because a startup might seem like something that you're building for a few years and then you move on to the next thing or you work in it and you move on to the next thing. But the successes that we are all looking for and the successes that we follow are the ones that have made it onto the next stage and they've turned themselves into big companies, which I'm sure is the ambition that all of you have. So all of a sudden, this visual that you see here becomes a lot more relevant because at the end of the day, like we've assessed the steps that come into making this t-shirt or making this software, but where do we make the money? With the margins, right? You can sell at the highest price. You've calculated according to your financial model, what is the revenue that you'll be making? What is the ROI on all of these efforts? Boom, you're able to sell and maybe even with a premium or at a larger quantity, if it's the t-shirt or you're able to sell to even more users your product. What happens if your product is maybe not doing so well, but you need to kind of get to this milestone that is getting you to get the next fundraise done or get the next big client because you've been able to validate that you can work with that many people. You discount and you're like, I'm going to do a POC. The POC is going to cost maybe to the corporate 3K, 5K, 20K, but it will allow me to demonstrate to the world that I validated my product, right? This is when you go into kind of selling at the lower cost, but with the hope that the return on investment for that 
to be your next milestone that allows you to go and excite these investors and next clients and any kind of employee that maybe doesn't yet believe in the company, but you truly believe in them. Companies go bust as well. Like we've had quite a lot of cases. There's been a lot of news as well about companies. And when this happens, this is because the sales didn't work and that there was nothing sold. So there's not even margins to be made. Well, margins are particularly important for a business that is, for example, in the food industry. There, the margins are tiny. If you look into automotive, same story. You're building something that is super complex. We have clients like BMW. They're building cars of the future and of today that are absolutely mind-blowing, like with 50% less material. But there's been years of work that have gone beforehand. When you talk about startups, when you talk about software, you're really talking about the opportunity for you to define your own reality where your model can be the freemium, your model can be charge per feature, but the beauty is that there's no allowance for anyone to kind of give up on testing if one model works or another doesn't. And with this, essentially, for you to define as a startup founder the pathway that gets you to this highest level of margin, highest level of revenue. That's why we're startup and not corporates, because we can test, right? And we can do MVPs and we can allow ourselves to experiment. So what does a margin mean? Well, actually nothing. We in Plan A have been working now with 1,500 companies. Companies like the Chloe's, Deutsche Banks, BNP, Apex, Ghani, Philippa K. And what we do for them is a SaaS platform, a decarbonization solution that allows them to understand the return on investment on sustainability. But with all of the hype around sustainability, you can also imagine that probably the names that I'm listing are a notch more excited than others. So we've needed to tell them, you know, we're opening up a new industry, we're digitizing sustainability. What are your margins, the investor asks. You are, well, actually, I don't know yet because I don't even know how to price my product. When we started working with companies and corporates, I remember the first POC that we did with Societe Generale. They paid us 6,000 euros for us to develop a full module on our platform that was for 20 people worth of work and time which is essentially allowing us to enter for the first time into this massive corporate. Did we do it? Yes. Was it an amazing opportunity? Of course. Was this a lot of money that we were able to make? No. Did, were there any margins? No. We were at actually the loss of what we ended up putting effort and allowance and resources and time into. So when I say nothing, is what a margin means is because we as a tech community have the best opportunity to experiment a lot, but also understand that the only allowance that we're ever going to be given to have visibility as a company that is three people, but you know, you want the whole world to know about you, will be when we allow ourselves to only fixate on one thing, and this is turning price into value. So through this history, and I can tell you a lot of sad stories, happy stories, uh, there's been a lot of learnings. And alongside, of course, the practical learning of being a founder that goes on to understanding from the day-to-day, -day, from the operational side, what does sustainability mean for these businesses? I've also read a lot of books, and I'm sure that all of you have relied a lot on the startup Bibles that have given us an angle to fill the pain of someone without maybe experiencing it ourselves. A few lessons that I've learned, or at least I've highlighted from all the books that I've read, uh, I think more goes into the practice rather than in the Bible setup, is actually to sell value, not features. First lesson, and probably the most important one, if you don't remember anything of this presentation, remember this one. As a startup founder, you are standing in front of a big vision, in front of an exciting opportunity that you're building together with your friends, with your co-founders, with your 
um, co-workers in the company that you're currently in, but you're moving on to another one. And what you need to understand is that the contracts that you're going to be able to sign are not going to be based on the three buttons that are missing on your product, but it's going to be based on the fact that in front of you, a corporate, even an individual, someone is sitting with the wish to be able to solve a problem for themselves. When we talk about the situation that I mentioned in the beginning with the airport, where you've lost your luggage, you have one T-shirt, I can pinpoint probably like 10 of you and we'll get 10 different options of how we solve this problem. Someone is going to buy another T-shirt, another person is going to wait at the airport, maybe someone's going to cry, there's going to be some people that are going to call a friend to get a T-shirt. And what this is here to show you is that for every single feature that you build for a client, you need to have validated it with a lot of data points that it really is worth the time and effort of your tiny or huge development team to turn this value or problem-solving capacity into something that is allowing uh, for the client to solve its problem. I remember the first time when uh, a client called us, Gani is one of our first fashion clients. They signed up with us when we were six, seven people in the company, and they chose us over like these big software companies uh, that were doing not similar stuff, but at that time something that could be potentially overlapping related to data collection and so on. And I remember getting the phone call of actually us being selected as a partner. And Lauren said, well, we chose you because you have the value alignment, because you are the only ones that have talked to us about decarbonization rather than only about data gathering, carbon accounting, and so on. But also because we see within you someone that can solve long-term our problem. And we're signing a one-year contract, so if you don't deliver, you know, we see you later. Still uh, one of our most exciting and most innovative fashion clients. Something that I love to do, and I think uh, for anyone that knows me, it is not a uh, secret that I truly believe in the concept of breaking the rules. When I started Plan A, there was no one on the green tech field. 2016, there was barely anyone talking about that in the investment community. All the VCs were actually a little bit still, is this an NGO kind of a company? Is this actually a company that can make money? And what ended up happening was that for two years, I had to go on a phone call with a client, potential client, an investor, and always check in with two questions. If there was a level of knowledge about the topic that would allow me to explain what we were doing, or I actually needed to go a step back and be this person that is dedicating this half an hour to the opportunity to give a chance to a, a partner to go on this sustainability journey for themselves. The regular of the rules in this kind of case is that usually we as people get a little bit obsessed with KPIs, a little bit obsessed with day-to-day -day, uh, kind of analysis of the effectiveness of the operations of our businesses. But if you, and I'm assuming many of you are working in new fields like AI or anything in sustainability, you might be building something that does not exist yet. You might be offering something to someone that is not even in their minds yet defined as a product that has a shape and a form. What this means is that you need to understand that if someone tells you, well, look, we don't invest in fintech because now these are not good times for fintech, at the end of the day, this is just the opportunity for you to define, am I a fintech, am I a prop tech, am I a climate tech, and what are the connecting points that I have between the different industries that I'm connecting my solution to? Because maybe it is actually allowing for multiple problems to be solved for multiple types of industries or tech approaches. When you get in a conversation with someone um, that is not understanding what you're building, and they may be questioning the validity of it or whether you've been able to spend enough time to justify that this product needs to exist, it needs funding. You actually need to take a step back and always ask them, okay, which rule do I need to break? Do I become a little bit fixated on educating them or do I become a little bit fixated on understanding that this conversation is maybe not worth my time? 
and I'm going to go somewhere else and find the next partner that is going to trust me and my company. Pricing is quite interesting when it comes to actually asking for money. I remember the first times that I would go in front of a business and I would be asking for, by the way, this is the invoice. Uh, maybe you can sign the contract. Sales is elegance. Sales is actually being able to go in front of someone, explain to them how you're going to solve a problem for them, but also allow them to understand that they might not feel at this point that they want to pay you because they don't know that you really are going to be able to solve them the problem. And this is where the freemium model maybe comes in. This is maybe where the opportunity to work with a retainer come in. This is where you also have the possibility uh, to focus on first learning and studying one, two, five, ten use cases to then essentially start understanding how much do I price do I even price? Am I allowed to? And also, is this product that I'm building something that is truly understandable for the clients so that they can go out and justify for the budget holder to really go on and sign this contract that might feel a little bit awkward to ask to sign in the beginning? When you come into Slush, I'm sure many of you have been here many times. How many of you have been to Slush before? Oh, wow, new audience. That's interesting. Good kudos to them for being able to uh, invite not only the usual suspects. You come in this place and you just don't know even what like, to expect. It feels like a club. You're listening to all these like, interesting people. You're chatting to a lot of different investors. You're chatting to a lot of different potential partners. And you're thinking, wow, I'm going to remember that, right? When you go out and you start thinking, well, how much do I price? How much do I actually put as a number in money for my product? The first thing that you need to do is actually after you validated that your product exists and someone wants to buy it, wants to give some money for, you go through the same user experience and you actually see where maybe it's not going so well. Maybe things need to be fixed. I've seen a lot of companies go out and ask for um, like price increase against the same value that they're br bringing to the clients. Or they are asking for a renewal of a contract when they didn't deliver. Because there's KPIs, there's like, you know, numbers, we need to achieve our targets. The most important bit when it comes to reliving your client's experience is to allow yourself to really fix any of these user experience issues that are related to potentially you not always being perfect as a company that is 10, 15, 300 or thousands of people. And then comes the bit where I obviously have my biggest responsibility. I can talk a lot about pricing, I can talk a lot about money, about value, about customer experiences, but as a climate founder, I also have an additional reality check that I live by on a daily basis. In the last few years, there's been a few hundred percent increase in climate risk-related costs. These are costs that are not allocated anywhere on the bill of any institution only, if you take like an infrastructure that is being destroyed by a flood, this is the insurance company, the finance company, this is so many different stakeholders that will be impacted by that. So if we go back to this t-shirt, there's quite a lot of stakeholders that potentially could be in one way or another losing value and not making money. Why do these costs increase? Well, I'm sure that uh, many of you here uh, aware of the increase in emissions that we have. This is essentially this T-shirts being produced and not being sold scenario, where the landfill of you know, fast fashion or any kind of uh, products that are not maybe made to be turned into one that goes into a circular model uh, to be visualized. It's industry, it's transportation, it's a lot. 
So if we go back to the T-shirt, uh, the two dollars versus the one thousand two hundred, and this is with a lot of question marks, as you can see, becomes a bit more of a different game. So when you talk about these margins, you really need to understand that there's materials, there's the environment, there's factory workers, there's also the distribution, the marketing, and a lot of other things. So. For anyone that is not even working on climate, this calculation is incredibly relevant because at the end of the day, the equation for you would be how much of my team's time went into that, how much of our marketing budget went into getting this client, actually how much effort did we put from the sales team to be able to sell this T-shirt or this software subscription. So. How much does this T-shirt cost is probably an equation where you have uh, now hopefully a lot of ideas of understanding that there's a bunch of things that do not fall within any of these freemium discount or whatever models. Because the true value lies within you, with the knowledge that you have for your business, within your team members, within your clients' happiness, and within the possibility for you to increase margins but only when you've delivered and only when you've checked if these clients have been happy ones. And I wanted to kind of finish off with a few examples of what does it really mean to be a happy software founder that is delivering value, that is able to make the biggest margins. All of these rules that I mentioned apply across industries. And what is important to learn about that is that a happy user is this. The willingness to pay of this user is zero because there's no baby wallets yet, maybe. But the willingness to pay by the buyer is really high. And this is another equation that you need to add into your pricing model. Who's paying, who's buying, and who's using. There's other happy users where when you see your bank account and you open up the app, you look into the amount of money that should be there, and of course, maybe in the beginning when you signed up with this company, you're like, yeah, sure, I'm going to test this new fintech solution. But when your salary goes at the end of the month, you know that this is the place which you're super loyal to because this allows you to live your life. So all of a sudden, both the buyer and the user, which is in this case the same person, are aligned on the higher contribution that this product is doing to your life. This is also a happy user. I actually was yesterday uh, questioned on the necessity to put football fans from Helsinki. Uh, apparently, that's contradictory when it comes to which team are you supposed to support. I can explain that I do not know if I'm on the good or on the bad side. But if you look at this scarf, given we started with T-shirts, you're actually looking at someone that at the moment when they go to this football game, they're probably like super excited to allow themselves to be standing for their team with this probably overpriced high margin scarf that has made them happy. The final happy user is the one which goes back to this airport case. I remember there was a few months ago a situation where I was flying from uh, somewhere to Berlin and uh, in the middle of the flight, they tell us we're not going to be able to land in Berlin. So um, we actually need to stop over in Hanover. And there's a bus that is going to be waiting for you to take you to Berlin. It was 2 a.m. in the morning. We were told there's only one bus, but there was actually too many of us. So it became a bit of a gamble. Who's going to make it, who's not? At the end, a second bus appeared, so the drama unfolded in a positive way. But actually, uh, it was already 3 a.m. So what we ended up doing all was getting on this bus and thinking, you know, sure, the payment uh, was not done by my, me, but I would have been willing to pay for that. And the buyer, the airline company that paid for it, also had a high wish to pay because they were solving a problem that could have gone quite bad of organizing all the hotels for everyone in Hanover. 
The final key element of doing good pricing is related to an anchor. This is both a metaphor and actual term related to sales. Anchor price is the concept where you are in the mind of your client, allowing for them to have a reference point of how much your product should cost. We now know that we have two reference points for the t-shirts, the $2 and the $1,000. The truth and the anchor price that we all probably have is somewhere else, I would say, and I would hope. But if I look into this metaphorically, I would actually say that the most important bit when it comes to building a product, putting in the hands of a client, is truly allowing for fixating yourself on this price equals value, money equals opportunity to solve a problem, to allow for the client to have a reference point for the success that you're actually going to be able to bring them. Thank you.